I guess I should start by saying that I'm not on drugs. It feels stupid just writing this because I've never touched anything like that. I smoked a little in my senior year one time, and it made me sick. I've never been in contact with any of the really bad stuff, though. Before I tell you what's been going on, I want you to know that, because this is going to sound really crazy, like I've just ripped it out of the latest bestseller. I don't know much about this app, but I know you can put up your paranormal experiences in hope of someone out there having an idea of what's going on. That's what I need right now. I need one of you to tell me what I've seen because after careful deliberation, I'm starting to think that I'm actually losing the plot. Okay, so I'll start from the beginning. My name is Holly and I'm 18 years old and I'm currently studying creative writing and linguistics at Centerville College. I feel like I should give you some kind of background about me, but I don't think it's important. I just want to tell you this because who else am I supposed to talk to? My parents? No way. They'll think I've finally lost it. And so I'm telling you. Hopefully one of you knows what's happening. Maybe it's not just my college. Anyway, here we go. Everything started when I got an email with my new class schedule for this coming semester. I was eating lunch with some of my friends when the notification had popped up on my phone. Mia Sparks was talking loudly about a date that she had ditched in the middle of Starbucks because he wouldn't pay for a drink. And I was struggling to take her seriously when she was waving around her brand new iPhone 11. Now, I don't have designated friends, I would say. But I do hang around with most people from my English class. They're pretty chill and I figured it's either follow them or spend the majority of my time in my dorm room. I still haven't managed to get over the hurdle of basic communication with them. So I just sit and listen to the buzz of their conversations. Anyway, Mia had our table immersed in her story and was exaggerating every word with insane hand gestures. I was half listening. The cafeteria was pretty quiet that afternoon. I was halfway through my mystery meat burger, anticipating the climax of the story which was coming. I could tell by the girl's facial expressions. My phone vibrated in my lap and I glanced down. I had been idly scrolling down Instagram before Mia had announced that she had so-called tea to spill. Skimming the email, I figured nothing had changed. I had already heard from the others about the professors and the workload, so there was no point in reading everything. But something caught my eye. I'm used to my classes starting at 9 and ending at 4. It's been like that since I had started in September. Except for this time, according to my new schedule. I had a night class. It didn't make sense. I know that I didn't apply to one, but I wasn't seeing things. I had my usual classes, and then a gap, and then a night class from 9pm to midnight. Night classes here are pretty normal. My roommate takes them for Spanish since she has a long distance boyfriend who lives in Spain. But night classes are just that. They're usually there for students who want to learn something new. My roommate did ask me if I wanted to join her in these Spanish classes, since the girls' dorms are right next to the college, but I had politely declined. I used my nights to either call my parents or binge-watch trashy Netflix shows. Squinting at the yellow-colored block on my schedule, I peered at the text. English 1600-8 Introduction to Film Tuesday and Thursday, 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. The class was in the English building, but I didn't recognize the room number or the professor's initials. I didn't think much of it for the rest of the day. It was probably a mistake, but I figured I would check it out with student services just in case. When my classes were over, I headed to the main reception. The woman behind the desk was around my mother's age. She was reading a dog-eared copy of Harry Potter, and I couldn't help wincing at the coffee stains tainting the back cover. 
She looked confused when I choked out that there was some kind of misunderstanding, and then gave me a long, withering look before turning to the ancient-looking computer in front of her and started typing, her fingers dancing across the keyboard, dust flying off the keys. I was in a sort of a daze, wondering if her computer would load a basic YouTube video, when she turned back to me with an exaggerated sigh. Behind me, two older boys were wrestling each other and laughing loudly, trying to push each other out of the line. Hey, the woman snapped. Either stop acting like children or take it outside, alright? You're not in high school anymore, boys. You look like seniors. You should know better. The boys stopped automatically and straightened up, the two of them muttering apologies, and the woman nodded with an eye roll before turning her attention back to me. She settled me with a smile which didn't quite reach her eyes. No, it's no mistake, Miss Charles, she said, her gaze flicking back to the computer screen. The woman stabbed the monitor with a manicured fingernail. It says here that you've been put down for that particular class. Introduction to film with Professor White. I did my best to nod. Ah, right, I said struggling to maintain a polite smile. I could sense the boys' stares, their gazes burning into my back. Is there any way that you could remove me? I think I've been mistaken with someone else. The woman shook her head. I'm afraid not, Miss Charles. This class is required. I nearly choked. What? But I don't understand. I didn't sign up for any classes, and I'm not... There is no mistake. The woman was growing impatient, and the queue building up behind me were murmuring. I could feel my cheeks starting to blaze with embarrassment. Holly Charles, you are expected to be in room 1600-8 at 9pm tonight, until midnight. If you have any problems, I suggest you talk to the professor. Now, is there anything else that I can help you with? I nodded. My facade had crumbled. I wasn't going to stand there and act polite when my free time was being taken from me. Actually, yes, I said with a smile. Could I possibly speak to the professor? I do think there's been some kind of misunderstanding. The woman leveled her gaze at me. Miss Charles, if you want to talk to Professor White, I expect you to do it in your own time. If you want to know why you have been put into the class, might I suggest you take a look at your grades? It was a hard blow, but I just smiled like an idiot and I made a quick getaway. I wouldn't say my grades are bad, but they aren't the best. I love the creative side of my classes, like writing stories but the other side, like analyzing poems and pieces of literature. I can't seem to be able to get my head around it. I've been told that I'm excelling in the creative side, but as for everything else, I'm failing miserably. The extra night classes suddenly made a hell of a lot more sense, and I felt stupid for standing there arguing with the woman. It was pitch black when I finally made it out of the student services building. The girls' dorms were only a five minute walk from campus. I grabbed a coffee from the campus Starbucks and took my time walking back to my dorm. A guy was sitting on my roommate's bed when I got back. Though it's normal for Cassie to have random guys in her room, I ignored him, dumped my bag and coat, and I fixed myself some food. There was a leftover pizza from the night before. Not exactly healthy, but it was filling. I spent the rest of the evening just chilling out. The class started at 9, so I ended up re-watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I passed out at some point, with my laptop in front of me. When I woke up, Cassie and her latest hookup were arguing about something trivial. It was nearly half past 8 according to my laptop. I jumped up, managing to knock the empty plate off my bed. Cassie threw a stuffed toy at me in greeting. And that's how we communicate when she has a guy around. I wanted to ask her why she was sleeping with random guys when she had a boyfriend. But maybe that was a little insensitive. 
Cassie and I worked as roommates. We're not best friends, but I consider her as someone close to me. I did get a few words out of her when I got ready for my night class. She was hanging upside down from her bed, while the nameless guy was cross-legged, typing on his phone. Every once in a while, he would show her the screen and she would break out into laughter. Where are you going? Cassie straightened up, her dark hair a frizzy mess in her eyes. How are you going to a party? Night class, was all I said, flashing her a tired smile. What? Cassie lay back down with a light laugh. I thought you didn't want to throw your nights away. It's not like I had a choice. I told her that before grabbing my bag and leaving quickly, before she could respond. It was 9pm exactly when I finally found room 1600-8. It was a lecture hall. The place was huge, though there were only around 15 or so students. A screen was being set up at the front and I braced myself for a movie night. I knew next to nothing about film study, so I was planning on keeping my head down. Two kids sat in front of me, a boy with reddish brown hair and what sounded like an Aussie accent, and a girl with short blonde curls. They were talking pretty loudly and I wanted to talk to them. All it took was leaning over my laptop and introducing myself, but I couldn't bring myself to speak. My phone vibrated and I glanced down at my lab. A text had popped up on my notifications from my mom. Study hard, sweetie. I love you. I needed that. Some kind of reassurance urging me to keep going. I tapped on the message and started to text back when someone tapped me on the shoulder. Twisting around, I found myself staring at a tall boy with dark hair and a friendly look in his eyes. He shoved his phone in my face. Have you seen this girl? The tone of his voice had startled me. I started to shake my head, but my gaze caught his phone screen. There is a photo of a smiling, dark-haired girl who looked like she was mid-laugh. I shook my head at him. I just started. The boy's eyes darkened. He pocketed his phone and leaned towards me his warm breath grazing my ear. Get out of here. Jerking away from him, I frowned. What? The boy looked like he might answer before a voice sounded out. Mr. Tate, what are you doing in my class? I followed the voice. A man had entered the room. He was maybe my dad's age with graying hair. He wore casual jeans and a t-shirt and there was an amused smile pulling at his lips. Is there a reason why you're in here, or are you here to piss me off? The two kids in front of me stopped chatting and turned their attention to the professor. All around the room, other kids followed suit. I expected the boy to leave, but he scowled at the professor. You know exactly why I'm here. The man folded his arms. His smile was challenging. Do tell, Mr. Tate. Isabel, the boy spat. Where is she? The professor inclined his head. Mr. Tate, I'm afraid I haven't seen Miss Suarez in a while. He cleared his throat. If I do see her, I'll make sure to let you know. Now, I have a class to teach. I'm sure that you have somewhere to be. The dark-haired boy opened his mouth to argue, but the professor was quick to cut him off. Now, Mr. Tate. To my surprise, the kid turned and walked out, slamming the door behind him. In front of me, the blonde giggled to the red-haired boy. Wow. Wow indeed, Miss Chase. The professor was all smiles again. He nodded to the class with a wave. Good evening, everyone. Now bear with me while I set up the projector. Today, you will be watching Les Quatres Sans Coups, also known as the 400 Blows. When the hall erupted in a groan, he laughed. It's good. It defines the French in New Wave. Is it in black and white? The blonde laid her head on the redhead's shoulder with an exaggerated yawn. Can we watch something interesting? The professor nodded with a smirk. 
Oh yeah, it's in black and white in this chase. Might I remind you that you are here to learn, not to be entertained. The blonde leaned back in her chair with a chuckle. All right, you got me there. While the other students chatted amongst themselves, I psyched myself up to raise my hand and announce my presence. Everyone seemed to know each other and blanked me. But when I was raising my arm, the screen in front lit up in white light, and the professor was back at the front. Alright, so use this session to take in the movie, and next time you can take notes and we can have a discussion. For now, why not sit back and enjoy the movie, okay? Though in case you do want to take notes, feel free. He pointed to the redhead next to the blonde. Mr. Wilder, I have sent a docs file with some pointers to your email. The boy nodded. Thanks, Teach. The lights flickered off. I shut off all the tabs on my laptop and I took off my jacket and I got comfy. Now, the professor clapped his hands. Shall we begin? I waited for 400 blows to start. Except the movie didn't start playing. The screen was still lit up, but nothing came on. I expected it to be a glitch of some sort, and I looked around, waiting for the other students to start murmuring or laughing. But the other kids had straightened up in their chairs, all of them looking directly at the screen where a small black dot had appeared in the center. It looked to be pulsating and blinking rapidly. I struggled to properly focus on it. And that's when it happened. I don't know what it was. I felt my arms drop to my lap. My body slumped forwards, as if falling from my control. And something else taking hold of it. I couldn't move. Opening my mouth to cry out, I couldn't. My gaze was glued to the pulsating dot. And I couldn't look away. I couldn't look away. Okay. The professor's voice sounded louder in my ears. Just like last time, I want you to focus on the dot. I tried to scream, but my body wasn't mine. I had no control over it. A noise started up, some kind of buzzing. A whirring which felt like it was digging into my skull. The air felt strange around me, like it was alive, prickling with electricity. At the corner of my eye, the professor was a row in front of me. He loomed over a girl with pigtails. The noise grew louder in my ears, an incessant buzzing. It took me a moment to realize that it was coming from the two kids in front of me, the blonde and the redhead. Like the others, they were staring forwards, but I could have sworn the blonde's desk was trembling. Lena, the professor snapped. I know you can do it. Try harder. There was no reply. The girl Lena couldn't hear him. None of them could. They were in some kind of trance. The noise seemed to waver before collapsing into a dull screeching. This time, the blonde's notebook shot off of the desk. She hadn't moved. I know she didn't move because the blonde was frozen. Above us, the lights flickered. I was staring at the dot which was bouncing across the screen when something popped. At first, I didn't know what it was, but something hit me. It was warm and wet. It oozed down the front of my face. A scarlet smear I was in denial of at first. It couldn't be, I thought hysterically. But it was. It was red. I saw red, and I knew it was red. Something red had hit me, and I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. The noise had stabilized. But something inside me knew that it was Lena that had popped and it was Lena that was covering me. Pity. The professor's voice was ringing in my head, and the dot was still dancing, twirling around the screen. He cleared his throat. He was talking to someone, but I don't know who it was. You were doing so well, Miss Daniels. The professor hummed. Don't just stand there and clean her up, and mark Miss Daniels has failed. And then he was jogging up the steps towards me. No, not me. He was heading towards the kids in front of me. My best students, he beamed. 
I noticed there was red on the redhead's desk. It was dripping. But I don't know if it was him, if he was the one bleeding, or if he too was covered in Lena. I had to concentrate on something. I had to focus on anything that wasn't the warm and wet blood stuck to my hair and staining me, painting me in her. It was paint, I kept telling myself. I was covered in paint. Paint, paint. Kenji. The man leaned forward towards the frozen boy. I expect more from you after yesterday's session. The boy didn't respond. He didn't move. His expression was frozen. Brown eyes glued to the screen. I waited for it to happen to him. I waited. Oh God. I waited for him to pop. The buzzing started up in my ears again. And I felt it. Like a physical entity climbing into my skull. A swarm of bees feasting on brain tissue. The air around me swam. I felt it prickle. Tiny needles sticking into my skin. The professor leaned further, his hand whipping out and gripping the boy's hair. Kenji's body was limp, his head lolling, but his eyes didn't leave the screen. Do it, the professor hissed. You have all been subjugated, so I expect you all to deliver. Maybe I was hallucinating. Maybe I was seeing things because my mind was a whirlwind. Until that moment, Kenji's hands had been on the desk palms down. The noise, the buzzing, the wavering. It was growing erratic. The boy's hands clenched into fists and then flexed. His laptop in front of him seemed to jerk. And like invisible hands were wrapping themselves around it, the MacBook lifted into the air, hovering. Kenji's hands flexed once again, and the laptop dropped back down. Next to Kenji, the blonde was doing the same thing. Her hands were balled into fists and then coming apart, and her textbook was hovering in front of her, before dropping in sync with the laptop. I could only see the two of them, but from these sound of gentle thuds around the room, the pencils and pens falling back on a desk, the same thing was happening to the other students. No, sweet Lily, I don't even have to ask you, do I? The professor chuckled, before heading back to the front. I don't know what happened after that. I couldn't move. I don't know how long for. My mind seemed to shut down, but I never tore my eyes from the screen. From the black dot. At some point, the red had been taken off of me. I don't know how. Maybe it wasn't even there in the first place. That's what I kept thinking. That's what I kept hoping. It felt like a century had passed when I finally blinked. My body was mine again. The lights had come on, and all around me my classmates were stretching in their seats and turning to their friends, chatting. My hands went to my face to peel at the red still tainting my skin, but there was nothing to scrub away. Nobody was screaming, not even me. The professor was back at the front. All right, 400 blows, what do you guys think? Boring, Lily retorted with a laugh. She nudged Kenji, who was packing up his bag. The two of them were like me. There was no red. Lena was no longer covering them. I'm pretty sure Kenji fell asleep. The boy laughed. I did not. He rubbed at his eyes. I thought it was pretty good actually. My gaze went to where Lena had been sitting. The girl was gone and there were no traces of her. No blood, no red. No deep cardinal stain in her desk and chair, and the floor beneath where she had sat. I could still see her. The pigtails that I had subconsciously thought were childish. Her blue eyes when she had turned and smiled at everyone. Her lips curved around the end of her pen. All right, that's it for this session. The professor was beaming. Hey, nice work today, guys. Kenji and Lily jumped up, and there was a moment when I thought that they were going to start screaming. When the true horror of what they had been through registered in their heads. But they didn't scream. Lily grabbed Kenji's arm and nuzzled into him. 
Their voices sounded strange. Alien. Like I wasn't really hearing them. My place? He nodded with a grin. I have Crash Bandicoot on my Switch, so I can beat your butt at it. The blonde shoved him. I'd like to see you try. I don't know why I was paying so much attention to them. I wanted to talk to them. But I wanted to ask them what the heck just happened. But my mouth wouldn't work. I left the class and the second I was pushing my way through the door out into a blizzard, I threw up. I was on my knees in two inches of snow, heaving up my crappy meal from earlier. And someone was talking to me, shouting at me. But their voice was barely registering. I could still see the dot wavering in my peripheral vision. It was right there teasing me. Mocking me. Hey, hey you, what happened in there? Are you okay? Do you need me to call someone? Look, my name is... I pushed past him and shook my head. Swiping bile from my lips. It was warm like the blood. Like Lena, spilling down my chin. I depressed my lips together to stop myself from barfing again. Fine, I heard myself say, forcing my legs to carry me. I felt weak like I was going to collapse, but I willed myself to keep going. My body was on autopilot. I don't remember coming home. I'm wet and cold and I can't stop throwing up. I've showered four times, but I can still feel Lena on me. I can still feel her on me. Get her off of me. Someone is banging at my door. Cassie's asleep, but I don't want to wake her. I don't want to scare her. Please, you have to help me. Am I crazy? Disclaimer. I want to make it clear to you that this happened in the year 2016. What our town is and never told the world, and if they have... The world have kept it silent. I've been advised to talk about my experience, but sitting here on my laptop and just typing is so much better. I want someone out there to know what happened to me and my friends. I want to tell someone, and you guys seem like the best people to pour my life out to. The average human being is supposed to sneeze four times a day, according to Google at least. Obviously, test results aren't always completely scientifically accurate. But that's the most recent estimate. I, however, at 16 years of age, had managed to bypass that statistic by a mile. I wasn't the first and certainly I wouldn't be the last. But it was rather these circumstances surrounding me that made my case a lot more interesting. Though it wasn't anything to be proud of. I had sneezed nearly 14 times in a row in the space of a few minutes, and after desperately trying to stifle a spluttered cough attacks attacking my chest, I was pretty sure that I was dying. 14 sneezes wasn't too serious. In fact, there was a Guinness World Record achievement for 82 sneezes held by 18-year-old Lana Seldom from Germany, the forest of course. Though the thing was, I wasn't just sneezing. To put it simply, my body felt like it was on fire. My limbs were numb. Every sneeze felt closer to projecting my lungs from my bloody lips. Bloody because every sneeze was agonizing, violently shaking my trembling body with every sternutation. Whatever the heck was happening to me, it wasn't your average sickness. It wasn't normal, and for the first time in my life, I wondered if I was really dying. If that was it, the light at the end of the tunnel. I didn't know what dying felt like. I was practically a kid. I didn't even have a driver's license. I was, however, pretty sure that normal people weren't supposed to sneeze themselves to death. Because that would be hilarious, honestly. It would be the bizarre, totally non-funny plot of a Adam Sandler movie that got shoved onto Netflix. Because that wasn't how you were supposed to die. It was either a heart attack or a brain hemorrhage. Especially so young. I didn't understand why it was my time. 
My life, or I guess my normal life, had ended stumbling down some dead-end street on the south side of our little town. I should probably say that our town isn't very well known. We're small, small enough to be forgotten. There are about 1,500 of us, and everyone knows everyone's business. Our high school have around 100 kids per year group. We're pretty small. I was scared. I was more scared than I had ever been in my life. My steps were stumbled, and I could barely hold myself. Every movement meant more coughing, more spluttering. My hands over my nose, getting water with stark red. That's what I called it anyway. Red. I didn't want to call it what it really was. Because then, I would be admitting to myself that I was bleeding out. That every orifice was bleeding out. And there was so much red. And it was everywhere. It was on my clothes and the tips of my fingers. I could feel it dribbling down my chin and wet on my lips. So much red. And I wasn't ready to accept it. I wasn't ready to come to terms that my body, for whatever reason, was rejecting me. It didn't make sense. I remember saying it over and over again, muttering it to myself. Though it kind of did, I was just in a crap load of denial. The truth was in the back of my mind. I had been expecting it. I wasn't the first one with symptoms. I had already seen them hours before, and I had ignored it. My first instinct was to call my father. He wouldn't know what to do, surely. Dad always knew what to do. Slipping trembling hands into my pockets, I grabbed for my phone. And at that same moment, something trickled from my nose. Something wet and warm snaking down my skin. Tainting me, painting me like my body was its canvas. It reminded me of earlier on in the afternoon, when everything had been reasonably normal, for me at least. I had been sitting a few seats behind another student in AP English, Clara Mayer. She was one of the popular girls, someone who stood out among the crowd. Clara had short blonde hair and wore pastel colors, like she was a walking Instagram edit. The girl had worn a flower crown every day that week, and I remember staring hard at it, wondering if the thing weaved through her curls would attract bugs. The flower crown on that particular day looked odd. Blooming white roses that looked pretty, sure, but clashed with the blood pouring from her nose and pooling between her pale fingers pressed over her mouth and nose. It made her look almost angelic. It was childish innocence placed on the head of a dying girl. I thought it was a nosebleed. And so did Clara, maybe. She had grabbed a tissue from her bag and pressed it to her nose, hunching over further. I continued to ignore her. I thought about other things. The weekend that was coming up and having no friends to spend it with. Oh well. There was always The Sims. It's if my father wasn't using my laptop to gamble away my child support. I thought of a lot of things that afternoon. Most of which were nothing to do with school, or Clara, or my dissipating classmates. I didn't notice the empty chairs that dotted around me. I wanted to remain ignorant. I wanted to ignore Clara's stifled coughing that she was trying to hide, hunched over her textbook, which wasn't open. I wanted to ignore the cuffs of her cardigan sleeves splashed with red, and her small body quivering in her chair. Her hands flexing and then curling into fists. And then I couldn't ignore it anymore. I couldn't push it into the back of my head. Clara was coughing violently. She was well aware that there was something wrong with her. Maybe she was in shock, staring at her hands, which were splattered red. There was so much red, and the girl was frozen in her seat. Miss Mayer... Mr. Carlson, who had his back turned to the class, cleared his own throat. I suggest that you pay a visit to the nurse's office, young lady. If you're ill, you shouldn't have come to school in the first place. After a moment's silence, Clara had stood up and wiped her hands on her dress, which wasn't a good idea. She was still coughing, spluttering, and staggering. 
like her body was refusing to hold her weight. I had watched her dart to the door in single strides, her expression twisted with determination. She knew what coughing again would entail. Excuse me. Clara had whispered to the teacher and then to the class, before yanking open the door and slipping through. I could hear her coughing all the way down the hall. I could hear her labor breathing, her struggles to suck in oxygen. And I had forgotten all about her. The class had continued. Mr. Carlson had yelled at Becca Jason for being late, and the remainder of us had laughed nervously at the class clown's jokes. I don't think any of us wanted to believe that Clara was sick. That Clara was dying. And approximately three hours later, I had it. Whatever the heck it was, it worked quickly. I was in a daze, blinking through a feathered vision, trying to find my father's number on my phone. But everything was a blur. Nothing made sense in the mind fog, and I was drowning in it. A roar. I teared up at the nickname that my dad had gave me, but it was slurred and wrong. I knew what was wrong with him automatically, but I felt too sick to be angry. Too sick to be disappointed that he had once again failed to be a father. I imagined my dad and knelt on our bathroom floor. His forehead stuck to the cool plastic toilet seat. In one hand was his battered phone, and in the other hand was a half bottle of whiskey. I had taken a deep breath to steal myself, to stop myself shouting, because this was why my mom left. I wanted to cry. Instead though, I gripped my phone tighter and prayed he was lucid. Dad, I said softly. Dad, there's something wrong with me. There was a pause before a shuffling sound. What are you talking about, Rory? What's up? He gurgled a laugh. Are you feeling sniffly? I've got some painkillers in my jacket. I don't know how strong they are, though. Sniffly. I wanted to laugh. I tried not to, but it came out explosively, before turning into a cough which nearly took me to my knees. More blood ran, and I could taste it. Rusty coins on my tongue. Jesus, Dad hissed. Rory McKen, what did I tell you about smoking, huh? You're heading for an early grave. Yeah, I kind of was. Butting back a sarcastic retort, I shook my head. In front of me, the sky was a funny color. I don't know if it was my vision, or a dense darkness had started to envelop the horizon. It almost looked like it was alive, moving through the air. And turning my attention back to my phone, I shook my head. Uh, no, Dad, I'm sick. Like, really sick. Before he could speak, I cut in with a hiss. Uh, Clara Mare, she had some kind of sickness, and I think I've caught it. What? I couldn't tell if Dad was amused or freaked out. Like a stomach virus. What have you got, uh, some kind of cough? I didn't answer for a moment. My tongue was tied. I didn't know what to say. Rory. The way Dad was saying my name was making me tear up. Boy, where are you? I struggled to reply. On the other side of town, I said, recognizing the street. My whole childhood had been whizzing down the road on my bike, squealing with delight, before flipping over my handlebars and skinning my knees. I knew exactly where I was. I followed the moving cloud of black which was swallowing up the sun. I'm near Jonah's house. My first initial reaction was to go straight to Jonah's house. It was just on the road, barely five minutes away. Jonah had been my best friend until freshman year, when he had traded video games for varsity. I held a grudge ever since. But if I was dying, if I really was dying, then I didn't want my last memory of him to be a petty argument that should have been resolved years ago. Both of us were stubborn. I wanted to go to him, obviously, but not in that state. 
I just wanted my dad. Dad. I spoke slowly, careful not to incite another coughing fit. Dad, I need you to come and get me. There was no reply for a second, and for one awful moment, I thought he had ended the call. But then his voice was coming through, prickly with static. Stay where you are, okay? I'll break out Black Betty. I had nodded, even when I knew my dad couldn't see it. Before I could make a fool of myself even more, crying out to him and pressing him to get there quicker, I ended the phone call. There is a bench in the sidewalk and I collapsed into it, struggling to hold back another sneeze that I knew would bring more blood. There was something inside me setting my insides on fire but I was still shivering. I was freezing cold, wrapping my arms around myself. I kept stealing glances to the darkening sky and wondering why it was so dark. I don't know how long I sat on that bench. It was long enough for the sky to quickly turn a strange shade of black, a shade I wasn't sure existed. There was no moon, no stars, because it was still daytime. It was 4pm on a warm July day. Rory McCann. The voice had startled me after what felt like hours of staring at the cracks in the sidewalk. There were two men standing over me, both of them dressed head to toe in black, both of them wearing visors. Looking them up and down, I was already suspicious. They weren't part of the sheriff's department. I stared at them stupidly before one of them cleared their throat. There is an authority to his tone which I didn't like. I didn't like the fact that the sky was dark when it was still daytime, and the two of them barely batted an eyelid. Rory McCann, the man repeated, his voice muffled by the visor. You're authorized to come with us. I shook my head, swiping at my bloody nose. No, my voice was weak. No, my dad's coming to get me. That won't be possible. The other man said, We are required to bring in children infected with N7. No. My voice was shaking. I had no idea what N7 was and I didn't want to know. I told you, my dad's coming. I trailed off when it sort of hit me, like a weight to the chest. My father had contacted them. Of course he had. He didn't want to deal with it on his own. I could have cried. With that clear, I stood up. I don't need your help. One of the men reached into his pocket and my stomach flipped over. But the man didn't pull out a gun or a taser. Instead, a light bulb. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Mr. McCann, the man holding the light bulb cleared his throat. Very professional. We've been led to believe that you are infected with N7. He gestured to the ball with a jerk of his head. At 9am this morning, a leak was reported from the West County Power Plant. Whatever it is that has escaped appears to be infecting people under the age of 18. My head started spinning. Clara, her father worked at the plant. But I refused to believe whatever N7 was would be detected through a light bulb. I blinked at the two men. My nose was bleeding again, but I didn't swipe it. Opening my mouth to sputter questions, I was interrupted by a yell. There was someone being dragged down the sidewalk. As they got closer, I realized it was a kid being apprehended by these same men in black. The kid had a gangly figure, dark red hair, a scruffy mess on top of his head. Jonah. As the three of them got closer, I realized Jonah was in the same state as me. His skin was white, really white. The blood painting his face contrasted perfectly to the white. My friend was crying. I had never seen him cry and I had known him since kindergarten. But there he was, stumbling over himself, coughing and spluttering. Blood pooling from his nose and mouth. Jonah was infected too. Rory! Jonah hissed, his eyes widening, when his assailants forced him in front of me. I didn't like the way that they manhandled him, 
pinning his arms behind his back, like he was an animal. You're sick too. I didn't reply. There was a too much information and it wasn't going in. I was staring at the light bulb still in the man's hands. He held it delicately. Boys, it's a simple test. Touch the bulb. Jonah unsurprisingly laughed. He always laughed at the worst times, though the situation was pretty obscene. You want us to touch a light bulb? Jonah spluttered out another cough. That's correct, the man said. Of the little research we've managed to gather, N7 shows up in an infected child through electricity. N7? Jonah repeated, echoing my thoughts. What's that? The man ignored him. Touch it, Mr. West. You are testing my patience. I had found myself entranced by what the men were telling me. It sounded like BS, all of it. But I'd still watch Jonah lifting the tip of his bloody finger hesitantly, before pressing it against the glass bulb. I wasn't expecting anything to happen. Though something did happen. I saw the spark before Jonah did, because he was coughing again his whole body shuddering. The bulb seemed to struggle for a moment, before lighting up and illuminating every face in pulsing white light, Jonah included, exposing every freckle dotting his nose and cheeks. It was beautiful. It was so beautiful. That was the last beautiful thing I ever saw. Because Jonah was still coughing, his eyes were sizzling with light, with something alive. Something teeming around his iris and he was still coughing. He was still spluttering. And blood was pooling in his hands. That's freaking cool, Jonah said. His lips stretched into a wide smile. But his eyes were too bright. The bulb was still sizzling. Hastily, Jonah removed his finger and then he looked at me. I don't know what he was going to say. I feel like maybe it was wow. Something like that. I waited for him to stop coughing, but he didn't. The men holding him abruptly let him go, and I wondered why. The man who was holding the bulb had dropped it, and I wondered why. And then I wondered if the others were ahead of me in time, because the bulb was hitting the ground and smashing into millions of pieces. I felt warm arms wrapping themselves around me and pulling me back. And then something hit me. Warm and wet and red. So red. It felt like paint covering me. I felt the weight of it hit me in the face. I felt him and yet in my mind I could still see Jonah's lips twisted into that smile that I loved. I don't know how long I stood there for. I was coughing again but my body was ahead of my brain. In my mind I was still standing in front of Jonah and he was illuminated in that light that had ignited the bulb. The men that had been holding me were yelling, and I was being shoved back. One of the men pulled out a large clear bag and started shoveling the remains of my best friend inside. He didn't look like Jonah anymore. He was a puddle of red on the sidewalk. Strong arms pulled me back before I could start screaming. Sir... One of the men was yelling into a walkie-talkie. Sir, I've got my cannon west. Affirmative. A voice crackled on the other end. Are they intact? The McCann is. West succumbed a few minutes ago. But we're positive the remodeling is in progress. The men's words were like a spider tongue. I was frozen. Staring at the smear of red that had been my best friend. Maybe it was a trick of the light. Or the fever eating me up inside. But I could have sworn the pieces of my friend covering the tarmac had began to wriggle and squirm, like insects crawling over each other. I was screaming. I don't think I'd stopped screaming since Jonah had popped. More people arrived and muffled voices behind visors were telling me to stay calm, telling me to stop screaming. But I couldn't stay calm. I couldn't stop screaming. My best friend had exploded. And something was putting him back together.